Hi, welcome to a video on using the Gradle build tool to create Java programs. I'm Tom Morton. I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Virginia. This is part of the video series for week five of the Tools of the Trade class. So today we're going to show you how to use this beautiful build tool Gradle to make your Java, Java development easier. And I think you'll find that it does some things for you in a really nice way. So let's talk about Gradle for a little bit. Um, it's a very popular build tool. It's got a very nice, cute little elephant logo. Uh, it's very popular for Java and other languages related to Java, and they recently added support for C++, which I haven't tried, but I'm pretty interested in, in checking that out sometime soon. The way Gradle works is you define task. Uh, Gradle has a predefined task. You don't define them. Uh, but you execute those, and the tasks are typically like build or test. You can create jar files. Um, so a lot of predefined tasks in Gradle. Uh, Gradle works with plugins, so uh, each plugin you decide to use comes with its own set of tasks, and that's documented pretty clearly, and, they're, and the ones you need are very basic for this. Gradle will manage third-party libraries just like um, Maven does, uh, downloads these from repositories on the internet, just in fact the same, the same repos that Maven uses. Um, like many, many build tools, it has a control file called build.gradle. That's the standard name. And its syntax is really simple. It's actually in a language called Groovy, uh, but there's also an option to use another language called Kotlin. Kotlin is actually a new language, fairly new language, which has a lot in common with Java and may in fact eventually replace Java. It's kind of a nicer Java. Um, but anyway, the bottom line is we're going to use Groovy. Uh, you don't need to understand Groovy at all. Uh, the the build.gradle file is actually constructed for you with a lot of things in it, and you can simply just sort of edit it and, and make great progress. So there's some important links to look at. First, um, to install Gradle, it does not come st in standard on computers. If you're using a package manager like Homebrew or apt-get, you can use those to download it. Um, if not, you can you can install it directly as you might normally install stuff. And the Gradle website, gradle.org slash install, has great documentation on this. So you might want to, if you if you want to sort of play along with me at home, you might want to pause the video here in a second, go install it, and make sure it works by typing in a command line window, gradle-v. Um, the V stands for show me the version. Um, so um, one thing you need to be careful about is when you install it, make sure you get all your path variables and all the rest of that defined correctly so that um, when you run it, it finds it. There's also another link for a, a nice tutorial on the basics of building Java applications. And what we're going to do here follows along with that really carefully, really closely. So I really recommend that one if you want to sort of pop it open and, and look at it as we go along here. Um, if you want to skim it or read it after we do these kinds of things, it will help you out a lot. So in today's little demo, we're going to show you the basics of doing Gradle, starting off in the command line, but we'll also show how it integrates with Visual Studio Code, the IDE we've asked you to use. And by the way, if you're, if you're an IntelliJ user for Java, Gradle is really nicely supported in IntelliJ, actually nicer than in Visual Studio Code. So good news if you use IntelliJ. Um, probably also in Eclipse, but I haven't used Eclipse in years. Okay, so those are some nice important links. Let's tell you a few things that might be helpful on Gradle. These may not make sense to you now, uh, may not be that helpful to you, but a couple of things you ought to know maybe. First of all, when you run Gradle the first time, it starts a, a program, a background process, which we call daemons in computer science, um, that run in the background. And uh, they do things while you're sitting around or they fire off tasks while when you invoke something. So Gradle has a background daemon that runs um, to sort of carry out its build task. And that will keep running while you're working and in fact continue to work and eventually sort of stop itself. Um, when you get a third party library, Gradle downloads it for you and puts it someplace where it knows where it is um, in a sort of central cache. And uh, it's somewhere in your home directory. It's in the .gradle folder in the Mac OS and the Linux environments. I don't know where it is on Windows. Um, and it stores the libraries there. Um, and so that's kind of nice, because if you use Gradle on multiple projects, it goes and looks there. And if it finds it there, it uses it. It doesn't re-download it every time. When you're initially starting a new project, Gradle has a task called init. So you just run Gradle init in an empty directory. And it sets things up. And we'll demo that in a second. And so that's um, actually an important thing to do um, to get something going. 
And it turns out in IntelliJ, which we're not showing you today, you can do that from within the IDE. But with Visual Studio Code, you've got to do that from the command line and then open Visual Studio Code on that folder. All right. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is Gradle downloads a copy of itself and stores it in your project. So uh, that's kind of strange, but it wants to make sure it has Gradle um, there with your project in case you deleted it from your system, you could still still run it. Um, it also includes, when it downloads a copy of itself, it creates an, another file called a wrapper. And a wrapper is just a, a program that runs another program and does a little checking and various things beforehand. And we normally use the, the wrapper version of Gradle after the first call, after we first initialize a project. You don't have to, but it's slightly better to do so. All right, that's a little strange, but uh, again, if you don't, if all these things don't quite make sense to you, that's okay. Here's one that is important though. Gradle assumes a certain uh, directory structure for your project, and I've, I've uh, got a, a um, an image of this over here on the right, and I'll talk about it in a second. But when you call Gradle init, it creates a bunch of things that you might need. It creates the build.gradle file, which is the control file for this build tool. It creates a Gradle subfolder where this copy of Gradle is. Uh, that I mentioned before. The, the Gradle wrapper is here in both a, a version that runs on your machine and a bat version that runs on, on, on Windows. Um, there's a settings file. So settings.gradle and build.gradle are the two config files you use. And then what about your code? Um, it assumes that your source code is in a subfolder, a subdirectory called source, SRC. Um, and there's two subdirectories underneath it, main and test. And the test has all the test code you're going to use and main has all the, the non-test code you're going to use. So in this program right here, uh, in this example right here, there is a uh, one Java file called app.java that, that we're going to build our, app, our application from. It has a test file and both of these live in a package called demo. So demo here is a package name and if you might remember in Java we use packages to sort of um, group of programs together. And the way Java implements those is it actually forces you to put them in subdirectories. So if you have a package called edu.virginia.cs, it would be in three subdirectories. So packages are kind of strange and bizarre the way Java handles them, but Gradle makes it really nice because you just don't have to worry about it. Well, you have to put them in the right place, but that's pretty easy. Well, one subdirectory you're not seeing here is under subdirectory called build. And build um, will appear once you've first run the build task on Gradle. And inside build, you'll find the class files and jar files and all kinds of stuff that gets created. All right, so let's go demo. Uh, we're going to show you how Gradle's initial init task uh, initializes a project. And we're going to do this from the command line because that's uh, you can't do it inside Visual Studio Code, unfortunately. Uh, but once we've done it, we can open Visual Studio Code on that folder. And we'll use the Visual Studio Code editor to look at our files and make changes. And we'll switch back and forth and show you how to use Visual Studio Code for Gradle and the command line. Um, so one thing we do need is an extension. As you, as you know, if you're a VS Code user, there's all kinds of extensions that support different languages. And you had to install some of those for, to run Java. So go look for an extension called Gradle Task and add that. And of course, one thing that happens with Visual Studio Code sometimes you might have discovered is once you add an extension, it doesn't recognize it right away. So I advise you to add it, then stop Visual Studio Code and restart it. OK. So demo time. Um, I'm going to bring up a command line window. And I'm running on a Macintosh, so this looks a bit like, like uh, Unix. If you're a Windows user, you would be using the command prompt. But um, here we are in a directory, uh, and I'm going to create a new folder for my project. I'm going to call it Gradle Demo, and I'm going to go and I'm going to spell it right. Oops, how embarrassing! So I renamed it, and I'm going to CD into that folder. All right, nice empty folder, ready for my project. So let me clear the screen. I won't clear the screen. Let me run Gradle with the init task. And again, that um, the tutorial I showed you about building Java projects explains exactly what I'm going to go through here. So if anything's not clear, go have a look at that. Once again, I can't spell or type. All right, some things flashed by here, but there's a, an old fashioned um, set of prompts that ask you what you want to do. Um, there's different kinds of things we can build. We're going to build an application. 
And we're going to build it in Java. And notice Java is choice number three here, but it's also the default. So I'm going to hit return. And what does my gradle.build um, language? It's going to use Groovy. We're going to select the default there. Unit test framework. Later on, we're going to do JUnit. So we're not going to do that today, but maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll do JUnit. So we'll just choose JUnit. Um, project name, Gradle-demo, sure, we'll keep that. I could change my project name if I wanted to. Um, and then it says source package name, Gradle.demo. And you know, that's kind of long and, and it's kind of the same as my, as my project name. So I'm just going to change this to my package, my PKG. And so you could choose anything you want here. It could have been, you know, edu.virginia.cs or, or um, if you've known anything about package names, you know there's a convention for naming those. But I'm going to make it real simple. My package is going to be my package name. Okay, so things happened here. It says build successful. Two actual tasks, two things executed, and Gradle just did something. Let me do ls to sort of see what files are here. And oh look, there are a bunch of those files that I showed you before. And if you know Unix, I can do ls-f and it puts a slash after things that are directories and a star after things that can be run. It also did a bunch of um, files that are normally hidden there. You can see it added a, a git ignore and a git attributes and a, a Gradle directory too. So now's the time um, I'm going to switch out of this and go to Visual Studio so we can look at these things. So here's Visual Studio. Um, I'm going to tell it to open a folder and I'm going to choose that Gradle demo folder. And so a couple things are going to happen here. Um, one, you're going to see that the Gradle elephant appeared on your toolbar on the left. And that only happens when you open a file that has all the Gradle stuff in it. Um, it has um, the source folder with my files. Okay. It has um, the build.gradle file that we're going to edit in a second. It's got a whole bunch of things here. So, um, to use Visual Studio with Gradle, Visual Studio Code with Gradle, uh, you can't initialize a new project inside. You've got to do it outside. And then once you're there, you can start doing things. So let's have a look at the uh, build.gradle file. Um, this was, as it says, generated by the Gradle init task. And it's time to sort of make this larger. That's not what I want to do. make it larger. I'm going to do some Macintosh magic here to get a big screen so you can see it a little bit easier. So this is the build.gradle file. This is the control file for our our um, our application. So if you notice here, there's sort of sections with names. So there's something called plugins, and what's the plugins are defined inside here, and there's something called repositories, and that's defined in there. And the comments are like in uh, Java slash slash for one line and slash star and star slash for a big section. Um, and it's all this was automatically generated and it does stuff. So let me start off with a couple of things it does. First, um, the important thing are the plugins. Uh, the plugins say, hey, what tasks uh, are going to be made available for Gradle? And of course, the main task we want to do are to build and compile this Java program. So for Java programs, you want the, I, the Java task there. So, so you just leave that there, id slash Java. And we also, um, it also asked us about, are you, are you, do you want it to be an application? And so it included the application plugin there too. And it has a nice, um, that's for command line applications. So it's going to give us a, we're, we're going to make use of a run task from that. Again, this is explained in that tutorial on the web uh, very nicely. Remember I said Grave, Gradle um, has uh, package management support. It can pull down packages from a repository. And these repositories have names that look like function calls. And so JCenter is, is a, a, a Gradle repository that um, stores packages, stores libraries. And so this is where you tell it that. And you don't need to change this. But if you wanted to, you could. Uh, you could add more than one so it looked multiple places. But we'll just, we'll just leave that alone. I'm going to skip dependencies for a second and come down here. If we're going to run this program, Java needs to know what the main class is. 
you might remember that that when it comes time to run the program if you have multiple files you want to run the one that has main in it and so here um, by default this silly little this init program I called it silly but it doesn't know what your main program is going to be called so it calls it app we'll look at app in a moment but um, um, app is the, the the java file that has main in it and it's in the package called my pkg my package that's how i'm going to pronounce mypkg my package okay so um we could just run this and i will show you that in a second but before i do let me talk about dependencies this is where um build.gradle says what libraries do you need and by default it gives us a couple of them first uh, it assumes we're going to be doing unit testing. Remember, it asks us us about that. And to do unit testing, you need a separate jar file. And so this says, go get something called unit test, uh, JUnit. Um, um, that's its identifier. This is what you call it. And it's version 4.13. So this little notation has sort of three parts. And for this, there's something called com.google.guava. That's a guava library from Google. And the version we want is 290-JRE. Um, and I'll show you what these are in a second, but JUnit is there for testing. Uh, the other one is something else. But this is all you have to do to get a library downloaded from the internet and included in your bill. You have to just put the right magic lines right here. And I'll show you how to do those for new things here in a little while. All right, um, let's run this puppy. Um, to run it, you click on the Gradle icon, and if you want to build it, under Gradle has various tasks that are under different categories. So if you go again and look at the documentation, you'll see we want to run the build task under build. So we go click over here, a console pops up, you can see lots of magic things go flashing by, and it said, I was successful. If there'd been a compilation error or an error in your Gradle file, that would have shown up there. Let's put an error in my compilation file. Let's get rid of the semicolon for hello world and build it again. And you'll see you get a compiler error just like um, you would expect here. Where do the compiler errors go? They're not in the debug console, they're not in output, they're in problems. Ah, here we go, in problems. So that ran in what's called the terminal, just like you have a command line. And uh, the problems when you show you sort of shows you what's going on. And it says, you've got a missing semicolon on line 16, or line eight rather. Click on that, it takes us to the right line, it highlights it, we put our semicolon back and we build it again, and it's successful. But notice it didn't run. So to run it, I mentioned this application um, plugin, and so it has a it has the run thing. So if you do run, it runs it and prints hello world. Okay. Um, let me do another something under build. I'm going to do clean. Clean actually sort of cleans stuff up. It gets rid of all the class files. Uh, and a bunch of other things. So it kind of undoes everything. Let me go back and do run again. Run is actually going to do build and then run. You didn't really see this happen, but there it went flying by. So you can always do run um, and um, it will build and run your program. All right, so all that's under the, the little magic elephant here. Um, if I click on it, it toggles from, from um, it gets rid of this pane over here. But um, all your Gradle operations are there when you click on the elephant. Go back to your view of the program, of course. You click on, on the, the little folder icon. And I mentioned before that build gets stuff created. So you can see under classes, there's classes. Um, there we go. Lots of other stuff gets done here that you don't have to worry about. OK. So that's the basics of Gradle. Um, this is a silly program that was generated for us as kind of a template. What we're going to do now is add to this. We're going to sort of do our demo. So let me shrink the screen back to what it was supposed to be. We'll look at our next slide. So 
we're going to add to this. We're going to make this do something more interesting. We're going to uh, do some matrix multiplication. We're going to do some matrix operations using a third party library called Apache Commons Math. And um, we're also going to do something with logging, like we mentioned in the introduction video. We're going to use another Apache library called Log4j. And then, um, I don't know if you know about jar files, but a jar file wraps up all your classes so you can distribute it to be used. And so we're going to build a jar file that, that can be run from the command line. Um, and so you could send this to someone and they could, they could run your program. And we're going to do something a little tricky here because by default, these jar files don't have third party libraries in them. They assume that the other person who's running your program has them separately and you've set them on the, on the class path. But we're going to create what's called a fat jar, a jar that has every single thing we need so it's totally stand alone. By the way, the um, um, course website is going to have a link to uh, a GitHub repo with this code so you don't have to worry about typing all the stuff we've seen here. Um, you can go download it. So first of all, um, I needed to do some matrix operations, so I went looking for a Java matrix library, and I found a couple by doing an internet search, and I know about Apache, and they do a lot of good stuff, good libraries, and so I said, let's let's use that one. And so um, it's a really big library. We're just going to declare some matrices and multiply them, but you can do all kinds of linear algebra and eigenvalues and eigenvectors and all that fancy stuff you can do with matrices and mathematics and linear algebra. So if you ever need that, this is a place to go. So let's go have a look at this library. Uh, do I have it up? I don't have it up, but we can solve that real quick. Oops, that's kind of hard to read. So here's the website um, that, that talks about matrices. And, and essentially, I'm just doing this some of this code here. I'm declaring a matrix this way. I'm doing some the multiply operation like you're seeing here. Very exciting. But this is how I sort of found out about this library. But you might say, um, how do I actually get Gradle to know about this? Well, I typed. I'll show you what I typed. I said, hmm, Apache Commons Math Gradle. And I found something about Maven repositories. We'll look at this one. This one looks, well, look at this one. And this is a little hard to read, and it's got a video on it that I'm going to try to hide. You never know when you look at websites. It shows you all kinds of weird th professors, things professors have maybe looked at. All right, so notice there's different choices here for different um, build systems. These are all build systems, and the one we're doing is Gradle. And notice it says, hey, uh, the line you want to put to your file is, is compile group this, 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 this. It also mentioned there's a newer version, 3.61. But I'm going to grab that line and go put it in my build.gradle file, which is not that. That's my cheat sheet we'll come to. I'll be stealing stuff from later on. So here under dependencies, I'm going to do this and put 3.6.1, I think was the latest version. Yep. And again, wrong file. So, sorry again, I'm zooming in and out. But I've got one more um, thing to use there. Now, I want to point something out here. Uh, this dependency, uh, again, it's identified a slightly different way. And I don't need to know about that because because I found the documentation on, on how to include it. But I do want to point out that, that there's kind of a, um, that this is a, sort of longer form of describing something that's done in shorthand for these other things. Group is this first field before the colon in the first two ones. Name is this, the, the one in the middle, and version is the one at the end. So I could have rewritten this as quote uh, org.apache.commons colon common stash math 3 colon 3.6.1 close quote. But that's okay. There's just there's two ways of specifying this. All right. Um, I'm going to steal some code to, for my app program 
to sort of make it use matrices. And I told you I had a cheat sheet, didn't I? My cheat sheet um, says, let's, here's some imports that I want to add over here for Apache. And then my cheat sheet has some code that does matrix stuff. And it's right there. So let me grab that and let me put it in main. And ooh, it's really ugly and not indented right. Ooey. I don't know how to do this in Visual Studio Code. I want to change the indentation to make it beautiful. I think that'll do the trick. So let's look at our um, the code here. And again, this is just example code from the uh, Apache site. Um, the way you declare a matrix in, in this library is you create a, a, a nested two-dimensional array of doubles. And so this, this de declares a, a double, a two-dimensional array of doubles. Uh, and I'm putting uh, one five, two three, and one seven in that one. So it's a three by two uh, matrix. I've created a second matrix, M2 data, which is a, a two by four matrix with those values in it. Um, to get a matrix in, in the matrix data type in, in um, this library is called real matrix. And you have to have a way of converting an array from, you have a, a, a class that converts an array M1 data, which I defined up there into this new object. So this is a con almost like a constructor that um, creates a, a data type of type real matrix. And then once I've got my matrices, I, just like you'd expect, you do m1.multiplym2 and you get a matrix product. All right, well, let's, um, I wonder if this compiles. I could have left something out and screwed something up because um, that happens. So let's go to Gradle. I'm going to build it and see what it does. Now notice it's taking a little while here. And one reason it's taking a little while here is it's downloading that library. And um, um, it was successful. And you might say, how do we know it's, what did it just do? Um, well, I can tell you because I know that it downloaded the Apache library into a cache. I'm just going to do something fancy here. So I just did a search and uh, you can see that somewhere deep inside this hidden directory in my home thing, there are, are now files for Apache Commons Math version 3.6.1. Okay. So back to Visual Studio Code. Um, Let's run it and actually see if it does some math stuff. And it does. Uh, if we go back and look at the app.java program, we printed out the result matrix here. And um, we said matrix product colon and result matrix. And it printed it out like this because the Apache common math doesn't really have a very beautiful two string method for its, its matrix class. But um, if you look at this, it is a one, two, three, a three by four matrix, which is kind of what we were expecting to get because it's a three by two multiplied by a, a two by four. And um, the first field should be, well, you can, you can do the math yourself. Trust me, it worked. <laughs> okay, so um, there are some warning messages here about our version of Gradle, but, but um, you can ignore those. So notice how simple that was. We, we grabbed code from the library we said, oh, by the way, that library, this is it. And um, it worked. It just flat out worked. Um, again, if we go back to the command line, by the way, um, let me clear things here. Um, I can do Gradle build 
and it does exactly what we saw in there. I can do Gradle run, if I spell it right, and it will run my program. So you can do anything from the command line um, using the utility name Gradle, the program name Gradle, and the task after that. Okay. One more thing we want to show you. So let's go back to the slides. And again, I'm going to do some funny zooming here. Um, we talked about logging in um, the intro slides. We said that our, our application is going to do something called logging. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we're going to use an Apache library called Log4j version 2. And there's lots of tutorials for this. And most of them describe the right way to use that. And we're not going to show you the right way to use it entirely here because it's a little more complicated and we want to move quickly. Um, the right way to use this is to have a, a file called a properties file. And that's a standard Java thing where you define sort of keyword value pairs. And when you run your program, you sort of tell it as a runtime option, hey, here's the property file you need. And those properties are used as settings. And, and the setting that we often do in, in log4j is we say, hey, we, here's the name of the output file where we want the logging to go. Because uh, we've told you before that normally log messages go to an output file. And also in the properties file, you can set the level of messages you want. You can say, hey, I only want to see things that are errors or worse. I don't want to see little debug messages. For our demo, we're going to try to keep it short and sweet because we spent enough time talking to you tonight. Um, we're just going to write to the console. We're not going to use the properties file. We're going to define some stuff in our code. We're going to sort of hard code the level that we want. And this is not realistic. It's not how you'd really use a logger, but it'll be enough for our demo. The way log4j works is you do some standard kind of things to create an object of type logger, which is defined in the library. And then uh, if your logger is called, say, my logger, you would call methods on it. You'd say my logger dot debug and pass it a string, and that would send something to the log with level debug and a timestamp and your message. And so there's, um, we've mentioned there are these different levels, and there's a, a method to call for each one of the levels. They all write to the log file. They just, they just add it with a different, um, a different value, a different level of, of severity. And so the lowest level is debug. That's what you use to sort of print out debugging messages. Info is just just sort of what you might do with system.out.print. If something you think is strange, you might use warn, and that's getting marked as a warning. If something's really an error, you'd, you'd use the error method. And then there's a sort of severe error that, that probably caused your program to crash, and so you, you would use fatal. Now how you choose to use these is completely up to you, but the logger gives you the this sort of range of options of what you want to do. And they run from low priority to high priority. So I mentioned you could set the level you're interested in. So you could say, I only want to see things that are warnings or higher. I don't want to see the debug and the info. Or I want to see only errors and fatals. So you can set a sort of minimum level and log4j will ignore that. Okay, back to the code. Um, how do you get log4j again? I'm going to go to the web browser one more time. Remember I was looked for um, how to find and my first hit is uh, something, the logging on Apache site, and it says Maven, Idol, Maven, <laughs> Maven, Ivy, Gradle, and other things here. And it says, hey, if you want to use log4j, um, and you're using Apache uh, Maven, here's what you add. Ooh, remember I told you in the intro that Maven, it's kind of, there's, it's kind of hard to read. <laughs> if you're using Ivy, Ivy's another one. Oh, here's Gradle. Here's what you want in your dependencies. You want these four lines, four lines, these two lines. And again, it defines a group, a name, and a version. So let's copy those. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Um, let me paste those in here. Let me make the, the indentation pretty. Because I'm, I'm that kind of guy. Um, I'm going to double check my version number there to make sure I'm using the latest one. So I'm going to go to my cheat sheet where I have the, the working one. And yeah, that's the one I want. Okay. Um, so I've added a new dependency, another library. And so let's now go back to my cheat sheet and add some logging stuff 
to my my app.java program. And so again, um, I'm going to rush through this really quickly and not explain everything. It's This is the point where you would want, if you wanted to do this well, you would go off and read one of the tutorials and learn a little bit more about how to use log4j. But I mentioned there's levels. I mentioned there's a logger class we need. And then there's managers and configurators, and I'm not going to talk about that too much. Uh, again, back to my cheat sheet. Uh, and this is this is the final program, by the way. I'll just highlight some things here. Um, we're going to create this logger object as a static variable. So any method in our Java program uh, in our class can access this. So the, the logger is going to be called logger with a little l, and we call a what's called a factory method to sort of get it. So so we tell log manager, which is part of log for j, give me a logger, and we assign it to that variable. And then later on, when we want to print an info message. We just call logger.info and pass it a string. Uh, if we print, want to print a, a warning message, we'd call logger.warning, uh, logger.error, all these kinds of things we would set, do. But before we can do that, we need to actually do a little what's called configuration. So I'm going to add this over here in my program. Um, right after main starts. And it's going to complain because logger doesn't exist because I failed to copy this line for my static variable. And I'll zoom in in a second and you'll see all this. But I've, I've created my logger variable, I've configured it, and now I can print out these messages. Um, all along the way. And I'll, I'll change this one to debug and say about to do matrix stuff. OK. So I've made two calls to the logger. I have actually um, told the logger that I'm interested in only things that are at the trace level or higher. And again, in, in um, log for j in VS Code, you can sort of uh, hover over things and it gives you more info. So um, this is where you actually specify the level. But as I said before, we would normally put that in a properties file so that you could change it without running your program, um, uh, without, without having to recompile your program. So let's build this. In fact, let's just click on Run. So. Um, here are the two statements from the logger. Um, you can see that at 2243, uh, that's a timestamp. I don't know what the date is there. The, 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 um, hmm, I don't know what, how it's representing days, days of the year. Uh, but it is 2243. Um, I printed this info message entering application. And then um, we printed hello world. That's what the greeter um, that did. And then I printed a debug message, which is listed there about to do matrix stuff. Um, and let me change this from trace to error and run this again. And notice now. Um, we didn't see either message come along. We didn't see info or debug because I've said I'm only interested in errors or higher. If I change this to error and ran it again using the run task, I should see one message. And I do. I see the error message, not the info message. If I change this to debug, I'd still see the error message because um, the, um, oh, I also see info. So debug is the lowest level. So I'm seeing uh, info and and um, and error. So that's what, that's what I expected to see. So if what you've seen here is you've seen um, there's some fancy stuff you need to actually make the logger work. And you could go learn about that by reading more about log4j. 
uh, we didn't do some of the important stuff, which is actually write it to a file and control this level that we want to see from, from a, run, uh, a file that we can read at runtime. And that's what people do in the real world. But we just wanted to sort of make you see uh, the basics of what logging looks like. And we wanted you to really see how simple it is to sort of build third party, uh, bring in third party libraries. One last thing I want to do. I promised you we were going to make an executable file um, that we could send to somebody and run. And to do that, we are going to go back to my cheat sheet. We're going to grab one last um, directive and put it in build.gradle. And I'll plop it in here, and then we'll talk about it. There is a, a section called jar that controls building a jar file. And you may not know much about jar files. I wouldn't expect you to. But it, it, it's really a zip file that contains all your class files. And then there's a, a particular file in there called a manifest, which when you run a jar file, it looks for the manifest. And it needs to know a couple of things. It needs to know where your main program is, your main function is. And so you have to define the main class and say, oh yeah, the main, it's in the package called my package, and inside that, the class called app. There's one other bit of, of sort of magic you have to add. And this, this we, I discovered because this wasn't working. And I went and Googled and, and found things on Stack Overflow and other places. Many of our libraries that we use, including the math library we're using here, require you to say, when you run a jar file, something about multi-release being true. What that does, I'm not sure. It just seems to be necessary. You could also do some things here about the name of the jar file that's created. You can change its base names from the project name to something else. I've commented that out here. And if you want your jar file to have a version number at the end of it, you can add that and it'll name the jar file that. I'm going to come back and explain this next part in a second. But let's run this and sort of see what it does. Or let's just build this and see what it does. You might have seen the jar task getting executed there. Um, but what you probably now need to know, sorry, I need to go back to the folder view. Under the build folder, there's now a folder called libs. And in it is gradle.demo.jar. So I'm going to switch to the command line and show you The way you run a, a program, a jar file in Java from the command line is you, you, you tell Java, you give it the file name, and you say, oh, by the way, this is a jar file. So java.jar. And there we go. My program is run. So I could email this jar to somebody or put it up on a web server, and someone could download it. And my program is, has all, is completely sort of self-contained, and they can execute it. Again, I mentioned that it's a. Um, It's really a zip file, just to sort of show you that. Um, here's all the stuff that went into it. And as you go down this, you will see there is a bunch of class files. But also that manifest.mf file, that's the thing I was talking about before. Oh yeah, there's my, my package app.class. And then here's all the library files that needed to be there. OK, so the one bit of other magic I want to explain to you is this. Um, Normally, jar files, when they get created, only have your code. If you want to make what's called a fat jar, one that um, has all your third-party libraries bundled into it, well, it makes your jar bigger, but it makes it totally self-contained, so you can run it like I just did. Otherwise, if I tried to run it, it would have said, oh, you're missing these libraries. And so the way to make it a fat jar, and again, this is something I found on the web in the documentation, is there's a little bit of, gro of groovy programming that calls a zip tree that sort of goes through and collects everything it finds in, in a certain directory. Do I understand that? No. So I found it on the web, it did what I wanted to do, I plugged it in, and it works great at making what's called a fat jar. So um, our goal was to demo some things. Our goal was to do some matrix multiplication with a third party library, show you a little bit about the logging library, and to build an executable jar. And our build program 
did all that for us with a very small bit of code added to it. All these things are much more complicated without a build tool. So our final observations here is that Gradle is great for managing third-party libraries with Java. I don't know if you've ever done this in the past with ClassPath and JARs, but it's it's a real nuisance. It's a real pain. And you'll find out later on when you start doing testing, uh, Gradle also makes that much easier. Um, there's lots of other options you can set in, in Gradle, like which version of Java is the minimum version to use. So your weekly assignment that you're going to do is essentially going to modify the things we've shown you, the build.gradle file, and you can look at the you can look at the uh, program with the um, with the matrix multiplication. We're gonna it's, we're gonna ask you to sort of write a new program that does some simple little matrix operation and does a little bit of logging. And um, at the end of that, you won't have created anything very new, but you'll have you'll have essentially updated what we have to sort of make something work for you. So that's it for Gradle. Um, I hope you sort of appreciate how nice a tool like this can be. Take care and we'll see you next time.